Well, thanks, guys. I appreciate you joining us today. Um, we're very privileged to have the uh, the man himself, Dan Knighton, uh, joining us from Audio Precision and uh, down in Portland. Um, Dan was the uh, the brainchild behind uh, um, you know the five seventeen and uh, you know where it's taking Audio Precision with its business. Um, so we're we're excited to have him take us through that and do some uh, PDM microphone testing uh, as well. Um, my name is Jeff. Uh, I'm with Gear Audio. Uh, we look after AP here in Canada. Um, on this call today, we have uh, John Whaling as well. Uh, John might wave there if he's uh, listening. He's our broadcast and uh, AP specialist uh, within the company. And we also have um, uh, Peter, uh, who works with me in Ontario, um, and Sean out west, and uh, Bob, our, uh, our fearless leader there as well. So we're, uh, we're excited to have you all here today. And uh, wanted to make that quick introduction before we hand it over to uh, for, to Dan um, and I'll, I will let you know that this is um, this is you know fairly informal um, you know we've got a reasonable uh, crowd today but don't hesitate to let us know if you have any questions you know we want this to be as friendly as, as possible for for us Canadians today so uh, just let us know or let me know if you have any questions and we can uh, we can certainly stop and go off in a, in a different direction. And this is going to be the first of, of two presentations. Um, we're going to be doing another one on uh, Bluetooth testing using the 517 as well. So we'll be providing some uh, dates on that, but it'll be a, a couple of weeks from now. So uh, without any more, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Dan. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. Let me now refind my screen to share. Um, Okay, so uh, I hope everybody can see my PowerPoint presentation. Um, the modern era is uh, is quite interesting because uh, I'm actually uh, sitting in my one bedroom apartment, making a presentation uh, live into Canada while remote controlling an analyzer that's uh, actually some 20 miles physically away from me. So uh, it's a uh, some extent kind of amazing that all of this technology works. But uh, as Jeff mentioned, we can keep this pretty informal. The, the last presentation I did on this was uh, had a couple hundred participants and uh, we, uh, we had to mute them in mass and then have people submit questions. But maybe there is one person who should mute their microphone. But uh, for everybody else, uh, you know, if you want, if you have a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and just ask the question. Um, we don't have to stand on that formality here. And uh, what I want to go through today is, you know, the intersection of, of a few different things. Um, we have brought a new analyzer to market, and that analyzer has all the bits and pieces to be functionally optimized for measuring electroacoustic devices. And so that kind of is our impetus for, for putting this together. But most of what we'll talk about in this meeting uh, is not specific to the APX 517. In fact, a lot of it isn't you know, necessarily specific even to using an audio precision analyzer. I'll just go through the considerations we have and need to accommodate when we want to measure a MEMS microphone. And at a certain level, we're really just talking about, hey, how do we measure a microphone? So, I will talk about the 517 specifically. I'll talk about our interfaces for talking to PDM devices, but then I'll go through some higher level considerations in terms of how we're gonna physically do this test and what are the prerequisites for that. We'll talk about software configuration inside of the APX 500 software and the various steps we'll go through to configure our setup to make those measurements, and then we'll make some measurements. Um, and I'll, I'll pause at the end uh, for any questions you may have, but again, you know, as we go along, feel free to ask. Okay, so what is the 517? The 517 is just, you know, it's another tool. Um, I have spent over 20 years of my life making different gray boxes. And I really love them and get very excited about them, but I realize not everybody uh, cares about audio analyzers as much as I do. 
But what I wanted to do with the 517 was make a single box that would bring together everything you practically need when you're testing a speaker, a microphone, a headphone, or a headset. Um, you know, sort of generically what we would call electroacoustic transducers. So on the left side there where you see two speak on connectors, behind those two connectors is a 35 watt mono power amplifier. So there are two connectors and I should disambiguate that. Um, to a great deal, we've optimized this box also for use on production lines. And one thing that can be useful on a production line is there's some amount of time when you're testing a device, which is just putting the device in a test fixture and removing it from that test fixture. So part of the design here is you could actually share one analyzer between two test cells and ping pong back and forth. So they're two power amplifier output connectors, but they're really just switchable connectors to one mono power amplifier. That power amplifier has a voltage rail at 17 volts, and we can drive into a two to 16 ohm load. So we do actually have a little bit more than 35 watts available. The current limit is really going to um, restrict you uh, into what you can go in, but we can deliver at least 35 watts into uh, that impedance range. It's a pretty nice power amplifier, um, better than uh, minus 90, uh, dB THC plus N. And really one uh, key thing is we have worked pretty hard to make it so that if you goof things up, you can't blow up the analyzer. So we're of course output current limited, but every now and again, somebody connects the output of one power amplifier to the input of another power amplifier. I won't try and explain how that happens. Just believe me, it does happen. Um, so we've protected it against being back driven uh, and we've protected it to very high voltages. And the other thing we've done is we've built the impedance sense function directly into the power amplifier. So we're detecting the current uh, right in the feedback loop of the amplifier. And the other thing we're doing is uh, on the speak on connectors, those are actually um, four poles and we're using two of the wires to send the current to the speaker driver, but we're using the other two wires to detect the actual voltage at the terminals. That gives us a so-called Kelvin impedance measurement. From left to right on that front panel, the next thing we have is a two channel. So this is a stereo headphone amplifier. Um, you may or may not be able to tell that there are a couple thumb screws on the thumb panel, a sub panel there, and you can switch this out for a quarter inch or an eighth inch, or even you can get a little panel that just has two uh, BNC outputs. That's got a nine volt max output and it will drive into two to 800 ohms. Uh, and it's got the same built in current sense function. And one other thing I'll say about current sense um, and, and impedance measurement is the vast majority of headphone amplifiers um, have a few ohms of source impedance and that source impedance varies versus frequency. If you go to measure the impedance on a headphone driver and you do that via, you know, the very typical solution of using a, uh, a current sense resistor and then working backwards with Ohm's law, you get into the situation, was, oh, that almost always assumes, I shouldn't say almost always, that always that I have ever seen assumes that your uh, amplifier has zero ohm source impedance. Nobody ever puts the amplifier source impedance into the equation. And if that source impedance varies with frequency, it's even harder to do that. So nobody does. And so then if your amplifier is um, a typical power amplifier, well, those guys typically do have a source impedance pretty darn close to zero. So it's not typically an issue, but with headphone amplifiers, eh, it's not typically zero. And so you do see, unfortunately, a lot of impedance plots published for headphone drivers that are wrong. So one of the things we put effort into is our headphone amplifiers a lot more like a power amplifier 
in the sense that its source impedance really is very close to zero. On the analog input side, the most notable thing is really that we've built in uh, microphone power for measurement microphones. So ICP, IEP, CCP, Deltatron, every, every variation you've seen or heard on constant current DC bias microphones um, for 10 milliamp. Now, the other thing you can do is flip that over and just provide a constant voltage bias um, and that's software selectable between zero and 12 volts. And on the XLR connectors, we do provide 48 volt phantom power. Now, one thing that, um, you know, AP is not the first company to have the idea of why don't we put all the bits and pieces you need to measure a speaker in one box. Um, I would say that we've executed it better in a lot of the details, but one area where we've, uh, I think really done uh, something different is um, we have a wide variety of interface modules for different digital interfaces. And on the 517, there's a module slot that will accept any of our existing modules. So now if you're testing a Bluetooth headset or you're testing a PDM microphone or even something at the circuit board level with I squared S, that can all be pretty easily accommodated. So moving on, uh, one, one area that can be a little confusing is AP currently sells two different modules that provide a pulse density modulation interface. We have our older PDM module and we have our newer PDM 16 module. And they do some slightly different things, so we continue to set to uh, to sell them. But in terms of figuring out which one is right for you, kind of broadly speaking, the question is: you need to test more than two inputs at a time. So um, our PDM module has one data line coming in. You can multiplex two microphones or two other PDM channels onto that. Our PDM 16 module has eight data lines and can therefore measure up to 16 uh, microphones simultaneously. Now, one other thing that we uh, decided to explicitly accommodate is um, it's not awesome putting, trying to shove your APX analyzer chassis into your anechoic chamber. So on the PDM 16, it actually uses a remote pod that can be placed up to 10 meters away from the chassis of the analyzer. Um, on the PDM, we don't have a remote pod. We do have an accessory product we sell, which is a line driver, uh, which somewhat uh, accommodates the same use case, um, but it's not quite the same. Um, but there are some other details. So on PDM, uh, we have a function that lets you directly measure power supply rejection ratio measurements. That function is not available on PDM 16. The PDM module has a lot more flexibility in terms of decimation rates, whereas PDM 16 is uh, pretty strictly just the power of two decimation rates. Um, PDM also has the ability to induce or measure jitter on your uh, PDM clock signal. And then uh, right at the top, on PDM, uh, it has a PDM generator function as well as an input. The PDM 16 is an input only. Um, one way of summarizing it, we really optimize PDM 16 for people who need to measure arrays of uh, PDM microphones. So uh, of course, with the uh, huge popularity of smart speakers, um, more and more we're seeing devices that have, um, you know, need to measure six, seven, uh, or more PDM microphones simultaneously. Or if you're doing production tests of naked PDM microphones, it's useful to just be able to test a whole bunch of them at a time. So I would say that would be the primary driver of PDM 16 over PDM. And one thing I'll say generically is, um, we very often assume when somebody says, I'm testing a MEMS microphone, that they're testing 
uh, a MEMS microphone with a pulse density modulation output. That is not a universally true statement. There uh, are MEMS microphones that have analog outputs, continuous analog voltage outputs. There are MEMS microphones that have I squared S outputs. Um, so while in this presentation I'll be talking uh, and what I have as a sample device is an array of MEMS microphones with PDM outputs, vast majority of what I'll talk about will apply to any, um, really any microphone um, where we, we don't care particularly about what the physical sensor is. Um, so one uh, general topic I, I wanna touch upon is um, our test chamber considerations. Uh, this is something where um, audio precision has a long history in electronic tests. And one of the things that's frankly convenient about electronic tests is it doesn't make any noise. Um, but when we're testing uh, an acoustic device and especially a microphone, we have to have the um, physical environment in which we're testing the microphone. We have to give a thought to that. And the gold standard for this is to have an anechoic test chamber. Um, and uh, we all wish we had one. Very few of us do. Um, and those of us who do, it's seldom as large as we'd like. And, you know, the issue here is that the um, smallest frequency in which a given space can be anechoic is proportional to the size of that space or really to the wavelength of that frequency. And, you know, if we want to get down to 20 Hertz, uh, the requirement is, is, you know, awful. Um, Cause at that point we're talking about having a chamber which has a smallest dimension in the range of 10 meters. So even, uh, even a good sized anechoic chamber such as the one pictured um, is, you know, good to 200 Hertz, uh, maybe a hundred Hertz, getting below a hundred Hertz is, is difficult. For many of the measurements we're gonna make on a microphone, however, we can probably get away with something considerably smaller, particularly if we are testing a naked microphone. That is to say uh, something like a, uh, just a MEMS microphone chip on an eval board, not installed in a finished product. Um, what's pictured in the center of the slide here is actually um, a box that is designed primarily for testing hearing aids, um, but it has extremely good uh, isolation or insertion loss. So it does a really good job of excluding ambient noise from your measurements. And it is actually um, pretty free of internal reflections mm, above 200 Hertz, uh, maybe above 400 Hertz, it's really good. Um, so particularly if we're testing a small device or a naked microphone, and we're concerned mostly with voice uh, passband, uh, it can work quite well. And uh, what I'll be using today is a much hokier setup. I call this the half space. So what I have is my circuit board um, with my array of MEMS microphones just sitting on a tabletop surface. On the same surface, I have my uh, speaker that I'm gonna be used for stimulating the microphones as well. Uh, it is not an ideal setup, but I'll show you, it is actually possible to make real measurements uh, in this setup. And we're taking advantage of the fact that our um, device under test is basically flat. Um, so the microphones are sitting very close to the surface. Um, I'm actually, I realize in the picture, there's a half inch microphone, but I'm actually using a quarter inch microphone. So it minimally, the reference microphone minimally impacts um, the acoustic space. Uh, and the effects of a half space on a speaker are to double the apparent sound pressure. 
And since we're not making measurements on the speaker, we're making measurements on that microphone, that's actually gonna help us out. It's gonna give us more sound pressure uh, at the point of test for a given speaker than we would have otherwise. Okay, now the other uh, part we're gonna look at is what do we use as a um, sound source? So we're measuring a microphone. Uh, we need uh, something that's gonna provide the actual test signal. And one of the uh, challenges is, uh, this might be a flippant statement, but there is no such thing as a measurement speaker. Um, there is such a thing as a measurement microphone and a measurement microphone is really just a microphone that is optimized to provide a flat frequency response um, and uh, operate in a certain type of acoustic space. For example, a free field or a pressure field. But for uh, our sound source, we have to pick something and we're gonna pick something and then work with it. Uh, this is a pretty broad range of things to look at, but um, a classic solution that you'll see quite a bit is people will use a mouse simulator. Um, a mouse simulator has a couple advantages. First of all, mouse simulators are often, if not, I'll just say always, well-behaved speakers. Um, and what I mean by well-behaved is that they don't have a flat frequency response but they don't have any very sharp nulls or peaks in their response. And that makes it possible to equalize. And the thing that's, uh, I'll say drives a lot of use of mouse simulators is their various um, electroacoustic and telephony measurement standards that are based around using a mouse simulator in a specific geometric relationship to the device under test. And so, um, you know, for example, if you're making a uh, smart speaker that somebody can use as a speaker phone and you decide, oh, I'm going to test it to um, an ITU standard, well, that ITU standard is gonna call for making the measurement and it actually specifies the size of a table to use and where to position things. And it's gonna specify the use of a mouse simulator um, at a specific geometric relationship to the device under test. If you are not making measurements to one of those standards that requires the use of a mouse simulator, then you have quite a bit more flexibility. And now it really fundamentally comes down to the frequency range that you're going to measure your microphone over and what sound pressure you want to be able to achieve. Um, and that last part might be the more critical of the two. Um, if you want to drive your um, microphone, if you wanna discover your microphone's overload point, um, some, some MEMS microphones, you know, their overload point I'll say might be as low as um, 120 dB SPL, but some of them might be uh, as high as 140 or even higher. Um, I know some companies are um, pushing that boundary. And finding an honest speaker that can really generate a continuous signal uh, at those kinds of sound pressures is not easy. Uh, or perhaps it is easy, but it's not cheap. And then in addition to that, you want it to be able to reproduce that sound pressure level over the frequency range that you wanna test your microphone over. Uh, and then it becomes really challenging because every now and again, somebody says to me, I want to test my microphone to its overload point from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. And it's sort of like, so you want a speaker system that'll produce 140 dB SPL from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. I mean, that's, that is something you can buy, um, but it's a very, very impressive speaker system. 
Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by this, but then the other thing that you want in that speaker system is, again, it doesn't have to be a perfectly flat frequency response. Um, we can apply equalization to the speaker, but generally speaking, you cannot equalize resonances. So if you have a resonance in a speaker, you keep putting more energy into the resonance and it keeps canceling itself. So um, in terms of the frequency response, what I like to see in uh, a speaker I'm going to use for microphone measurements, uh, it doesn't have to be perfectly flat, but I don't like to see any sharp features, uh, essentially any resonances in the frequency response. And then uh, what I'll actually be using for today's measurements, um, as you know, the uh, shoemaker's children have no shoes. So um, I myself do not have uh, any fancy speakers. Um, I will be using this uh, three inch single driver speaker. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty reasonable speaker, but it's a hundred dollar speaker. And I'll say a couple things. Uh, Single driver speakers are my preferred solution when measuring microphones because they're um, easier to position, right? When you have a multi-driver speaker um, and you're working in relatively close quarters when you're working in the near field of the speaker as opposed to the far field, it's harder to position the speaker uh, and not see um, artifacts at the crossover frequency. You don't have a crossover with a single driver speaker. However, what you do run into is you're not gonna get a single driver speaker that works over a super broad uh, frequency range. So again, the frequency range over which you want to make your measurements is extremely critical to think about. And then lastly, I'll reference measurement microphone. Um, and this, uh, this prerequisite is a bit of my own habit for how I measure other microphones. Uh, as you've just heard me belabor the challenges and difficulties of uh, selecting a source speaker for your measurement, one way to sort of shortcut the whole thing is to measure your microphone by reference, or sometimes you'll hear the word substitution to another microphone. Um, and the beauty of that is you essentially remove your speaker from the equation. Um, when you do microphone measurement by substitution, as long as there is some sound coming out of your speaker, you know, this doesn't work if there's nothing coming out of your speaker, but as long as there's some sound coming out of your speaker, what you're actually doing is dividing one microphone by another microphone, and that'll literally divide out the effects of your speaker. Now, what microphone to choose? Um, generally speaking, uh, two ways to do substitution. You can either do them sequentially. So this is literally, you put the microphone you're measuring, at a given physical location, you sweep it, then you remove it, and you substitute your reference microphone, or simultaneous. Um, in simultaneous substitution is my preferred solution, because frankly, it is more convenient to just be able to play around with all your measurements as you go, instead of constantly going in and out of your chamber. Um, and swapping things around. And in addition, when you do um, sequential substitution, you know, you have to be moderately careful to make sure you're physically putting things at the same location. The downside of simultaneous substitution is you can't, you know, you can't physically overlap these things. And the measurement microphone is a physical object and it is going to disturb the acoustic sound field. So um, for that and a couple other reasons, my preferred microphone 
when I'm measuring another microphone is a quarter inch microphone. It'll just physically have a much smaller body. And the other th nice thing is that there'll be, um, not only will it disturb the acoustic sound field the less, but the quarter inch microphone will also give me a flat magnitude or frequency response all the way to 20 kilohertz, um, not quite regardless of its orientation to the sound field, but pretty close. A quarter inch free field microphone and a quarter inch pressure microphone um, have very similar um, magnitude responses. If you don't care about phase, we're done and it's super easy. Um, but particularly when we're measuring microphone arrays, we care about phase. So the other advantage of a quarter inch microphone and, and one of the sort of weird things that we seldom talk about with measurement microphones is a measurement microphone that has a flat magnitude response, say to 20 kilohertz, it is not going to have a flat phase response uh, to 20 kilohertz. Um, so this narrows me down into the quarter inch pressure field microphone. A quarter inch pressure field microphone has the flattest phase response of all within that 20 kilohertz bandwidth. And you notice that a lot of these things, frequency dependent, um, particularly if we're measuring a microphone that we're gonna use in a voice band application like a smart speaker, maybe I only care about 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz. And that narrowing of frequencies uh, makes the life of the measurement a lot easier. 100 hertz and up, the size of the uh, environment that I need to make that measurement um, is a lot smaller. Um, the challenges of finding a speaker that will generate the, the relevant energy is a lot easier. Going only up to 10 kilohertz means finding a measurement microphone that has a flat magnitude and phase response is going to be a lot easier. You know, everything gets easier. Um, if somebody says, oh, I want a microphone that goes, um, you know, I want to test this microphone from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, that is a real challenge. I mean, that is just flat out a big um, physical challenge. Um, it can be done. Um, and, and frankly, from the measurement equipment point of view, it's not any more challenging. It's all these externalities that are going to be challenging. Uh, so this is a little bit of a rendition of the test setup that we're going to go through today. Um, so exactly, I have everything plugged into my APX 517, which is configured with a PDM 16 module. So I've got the power amplifier driving a um, source speaker. I've got my quarter inch pressure field microphone plugged directly into my uh, audio analyzer. And I've got a little eval board with 16 PDM microphones connected to our remote PDM input pod, which is then going all the way back to the analyzer. I just wanna take a pause here and see if there are any questions so far. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me, let's jump into the software now. And so this is just what you'll see um, when you start up APX 500. Now this is 6.0 software and I'll be um, showing a few relevant features on that, but this is connected to um, our 517 right now. And we start in uh, signal path setup. And my output connector is currently set to power amplifier. I'm gonna go ahead and use that. Input, uh, one of the things uh, is a new feature as of 6.0 is the ability to have two inputs active simultaneously. I'll be taking advantage in, of that in a second here, but my first input I'm gonna use for my analog uh, measurement microphone, and I'm just using one channel for that. I am going to be using uh, acoustic mode. 
that microphone is unbalanced or it's going into the BNC connector, I do need to provide it with power. So I'll go ahead and turn that on. And what I'm going to take advantage of the fact, because I am actually remote to this um, analyzer, is I'm going to grab the microphone's uh, calibration data via the transducer electronic data sheet, or TEDS, which just reads that electronically. I'll go ahead and close that. And then I'll just bring up my signal generator, generate a sine wave out of our speaker and uh, verify that I am picking that up. Now I'm gonna do a couple things here. First, I'm going to go back to my output side and I actually wanna calibrate this speaker. So I want to um, set the speaker so that instead of just feeding it volts, I know the acoustic sound pressure that it's generating. So I'll set my output in acoustic mode. And then I'll go to references, output references, acoustic, and I'm gonna select set my acoustic output level. And this is just a function uh, to set that automatically for me. So I'll say, you know what, I want you to find me one Pascal and you know, I'm gonna guess that it's probably somewhere between 100 millivolts and three volts. And so now that has, uh, we would use the term regulated the generator so that I'm getting 93.98 dBSPL at one kilohertz. And now what you'll notice if I go back to um, verify connections is that I can set my signal generator in dBSPL, which is nice and handy. Now, um, what this has not done is this has set this really for this um, one uh, frequency and our speaker is not perfectly flat. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and add a measurement and I don't need to be super fancy. I'll just add frequency response. So I'm gonna go ahead and sweep the speaker. Let's go ahead and just sweep it full range just to see what it's like. We'll sweep it from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz now the generator says 94 dB SPL. That will only be true. I only expect it to be true at uh, one kilohertz, but we can start there. And so now we have the uh, frequency response of this little two and a half inch single driver speaker, which actually I'm pretty happy with. Now it is, it does roll off rather quickly at low frequencies, which is not entirely unexpected. Now in truth, this speaker is meant to be a part of a little 5.1 system. So they have put a cap in it. So you get a very smooth roll off towards low frequencies. But, you know, if I look at this response, it's actually, you know, reasonably flat uh, all the way up. Now, before I go to apply this speaker, if I try and equalize it, you know, at 80 Hertz to match the output level at one kilohertz, you know, I'll be adding 30 odd dB, almost 40 dB to the signal. So that would blow up my speaker. So that's what I mean about what is the, you know, usable um, frequency range and my you know, my rule of thumb is to not try and equalize a speaker for sure more than 20 dB. Um, and generally like 10 dB is kind of a, a healthy bit of equalization. So let's try this. Let's go 100 Hertz. 
to 20 kilohertz. And let's take our frequency response data and let's just take the relative response. Let's export this. And I'm gonna go ahead and export all points. And we'll call this speaker FR. And now I'm going to go in my EQ function and I'm going to say I want a relative EQ. And I'm going to re import that data. And then I'm going to invert it. And select OK. And then for comparison, I'll just append graph data. So here we can see, uh, just for reference, you know, the equalized speaker response on top of the uh, raw, or if you will, natural speaker response. One thing you can see is exactly above 200 hertz, um, we can get an extremely uh, flat response out of the speaker. Below 200 hertz, it gets a little wonky. Um, we can't um, linearly equalize it to a flat response, but it's actually still not terrible. You know, I mean, we're still plus or minus two dB. Now, um, I'll show you in a, in a few moments, uh, a sort of belt and suspenders approach to then measuring our microphones under test. But this is all the preparatory work. So we now have uh, a reference measurement microphone uh, set up and calibrated, and we've then used that reference measurement microphone to calibrate and equalize the sound source we're going to use to measure uh, the microphones we're actually testing. So I'm going to go back to signal pass setup. I'm going to go to input two. Input two, I'm going to select PDM 16. And uh, the default settings will actually work for us. And the default settings are uh, X64, uh, or in this case, it's input decimation. So it's one over 64 decimation. That gives us a decimated sample rate of 48 kilohertz and uh, a bit clock rate of three megahertz. So this is sort of uh, the most, I don't know, 80% of the uh, MEMS microphone applications out there are probably using these exact same settings. So a couple things. Um, so now if we look at our input signal monitor, we have one that is monitoring our reference microphone input. And then we have the bottom one is looking at all 16 uh, MEMS microphones on our little eval board. And if I go down here to add a new result, I'll say primary result, RMS level, and let's add it to PDM 16. And so here we're looking at the 16 channels of data coming from the PDM microphones, as well as uh, our reference mic simultaneously. And if I want, I'll just go back to my verify connections. I'll set my signal generator to 94 dBSPL. And I see a signal in the input signal monitor. And then in uh, our measurement microphone. And then I see what is coming back from each of the uh, MEMS microphones. And to some extent, uh, or at some level, I have sort of an immediate check on sensitivity. 
because uh, I'm generating one Pascal. And for example, on channel one, I'm getting minus 24 dBS, dBFS. So I could say, oh, that microphone sensitivity is minus 24 dBS FS per Pascal. Now, um, one thing to watch out for is uh, my little tabletop test setup. The uh, source speaker is quite close. Um, it's only uh, a handful of centimeters away from the array. So there's actually a material difference in distance from channel one to channel 16. So we have really an intermixing, unfortunately, of two things, which is both um, the sensitivity and the variance in sensitivity uh, in the capsules themselves. Um, so like this particular capsule, you know, the manufacturer says the sensitivity is minus 26 dBFS per Pascal plus or minus 3 dB. So, you know, hmm, is, is number 16 really that much less sensitive or is it really that much further? Um, it's really a combination of the two. But I do have that um, sort of immediate uh, readout and confidence here that things are all basically up and running. So now what I can do next is um, actually start making some measurements. So why don't I add acoustic response? And uh, here's where I have to remember that, oh, wait a second, I've only calibrated my test speaker for um, 100 hertz on up. And uh, I'll set the generator to 94 dBSPL. Um, one other little detail I'll say about source speakers is um, ideally, ideally our speakers would be linear and time invariant. And if I find a voltage level that gives us um, a certain sound output sound pressure level, half that voltage should give us half that output. And that's what's assumed by the audio precision signal generator when I calibrate an acoustic output. For a good speaker, sort of inside of its operating range, that is a true statement. But I think we all know that speakers have compression. And I kind of recommend that you calibrate your acoustic output for the acoustic sound pressure you tend to use in your tests. And it wouldn't be a bad idea. So let's say you're gonna do some of your tests at 94 dBSPL, some of your tests at 80, and some of your tests at 114 or higher to have a separate signal path with a separate acoustic output calibration for each of those. Because even if the speaker's amplitude linearity is pretty flat, it probably will not have a the same frequency response at um, you know differences in output of of 10, 20 dB. So that's just a little aside on that. So I'm going to sweep from 100 hertz to 20 kilohertz at 94 dB SPL. I'm going to load up my previously captured speaker EQ. Dan, it is possible to uh, put that correction and the signal path set up too, is it not? It is, uh, and that's a very good question. So um, what Jeff is alluding to is here in the output signal path, I can specify my EQ as well. Uh, 
Uh, there is um, there is a subtle difference uh, between when I specify an output EQ in the signal path versus when I specify an output EQ in the measurement, um, which is in the signal path, the EQ is um, implemented in real time by applying a um, 31 band bank of bi-quad filters to the signal before it goes out the connector. The advantage of that is it will provide an EQ for any signal you generate. The disadvantage of that is, you know, it's, it's finite precision. When we, gen when we apply an EQ in the measurement, the measurement knows exactly what kind of signal it's going to generate, and it will actually feed the EQ into the mathematical algorithm that synthesizes the test signal. And that lets us get an extremely accurate um, equalization function. So both are available, and frankly, Maybe if you're, you know, maybe if you're looking for EQs that are plus minus a dB, it doesn't really matter which one you use. But if you want that really, really sharp, you know, EQ that's going to be plus minus a tenth of a dB, then um, using the equalization function in the specific measurement you want to make works the best. So let's go ahead and sweep this. And I realize I'm probably going to run a little bit long. So if anybody uh, has some questions they definitely want answered before they have to sign off the call, you know, feel free to ask them now. Okay, so um, here's the impulse response of our measurement microphone. Here's the impulse response of all 16 um, MEMS mics, our energy time curve. Here is the um, frequency response as measured at the reference microphone. And this is great because it verifies for us that we got a good equalization on the um, speaker. And I can auto scale this to really zoom in and you know we can see, um, yeah, particularly, um, even at the worst, right, we're in a plus minus 0.2 dB kind of, kind of scenario here. So pretty darn good. So here's the frequency response of all 16 um, MEMS microphones. And you can definitely see you, you are going, or I, I'm not, I shouldn't say you are definitely going to, but I'll say in my scenario, uh, as those microphones get further and further away from the speaker, you do start to see like some wigglies here, which are a product of the fact that the, you know, we've got a little circuit board. It does have bumps on it. It's not a perfect um, sound field. And then one that's interesting to look at is here's our delay. And what you may realize from the delay is there is a little error in the uh, design of the circuit board and the left right data lines were actually inverted. So the microphone that is on the logical channel one is actually physically in position two. Um, but there you can, you can see the delay. And then if we look at phase, um, it's interesting to look at uh, input to output And, you know, here you, you see beautifully the delay in uh, time reflected in the phase of the uh, 16 microphones. And group delay, just a little noisy. But you get your group delay and on and on. 
Now let's look at a couple things. As I said, uh, since we've calibrated our speaker and set it to generate 94 GBSPL, we can sort of read the sensitivity directly uh, off this graph. In fact, I could do something like add derived result and say, um, You know, and here is the measured amplitude from the frequency response at one kilohertz. And if we believe that the speaker was correctly calibrated to give us one Pascal, we're getting, you know, somewhere between minus 24 dBFS to minus 30 dBFS per Pascal. Now, the other thing we have here is our um, reference microphone result. And to be very frank, reference microphones are more reliable than speakers. Um, simply, you have a much smaller diaphragm. The diaphragm is made out of usually a, a metal film, um, a metal foil. Uh, they're very, they tend to be much more stable in amplitude and temperature and humidity than any speaker. So what I can now also do is I'll take my reference microphone, I'll add a derived result, and we've added this new result called sensitivity. And I'm gonna compare it to RMS level from PDM 16. And now what I get is this is the um, dBFS, so that's our MEMS mic output per Pascal as measured by the reference microphone. And one thing that's nice about this is let's say I do this sweep again but I do it at 80 dBSPL. Can you explain what that, that is actually doing? Is it basically subtracting the measurement mic from it? It's subtracting, mathematically, it's really dividing it. Right. Um, so what is this showing us then at this point? So what's handy about this is if I go look at the frequency response of the PDM mics, I lowered my stimulus level. So you notice the frequency response now, instead of being up at minus 24 to minus 30, is now at you know, minus 36 to minus 45. But in the derived result, because I'm deriving this, the DBFS output of the MEMS microphones by the sound pressure output of the measurement microphone, the sensitivity, which is the ratio of the two, hasn't changed. And in fact, I can totally go to town. Now I can even take out my EQ. And so this is getting at my uh, earlier comment about one of the advantages of microphone substitution uh, is you get out of um, being dependent uh, on your source speaker. You're now dependent on your measurement microphone, but your measurement microphone is going to generally be more stable and more repeatable than any speaker. And the belts and suspenders approach is to just do both. Um, I set, you know, I've calibrated this at 94 dBSPL and I equalize it.
So would I be correct in saying that, you know, these mics are, you know, fairly linear, but they roll off in the high frequency, obviously above, uh, you know, 4K? Or is that yeah. a positional thing? It, you... it, there's some amount of positionality, and there's also some amount of the fact that we're way zoomed in here, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll always be... That's true. Always be a... You can make any device look good or look bad based on, on the scaling of the graph. Yeah, that's uh, much better. <laughs> but there's also some positional issues. As I said, unfortunately, I do not have the ideal um, test set up here. Now, real quick, let me just show you one last measurement. I'm going to go to transfer function. So um, I love sine waves. I test with sine waves all day long. Uh, at home, I, I turn on my hi-fi and I just listen to a one kilohertz sine wave until I fall asleep. But most of the rest of humanity doesn't do that. And one issue that we're running into is we're embedding microphones in devices like phones and smart speakers that have active signal processing and are going to treat sine waves as an undesirable noise that is to be canceled. So one thing that's handy is uh, to use a transfer function measurement where we're really going to just compare two arbitrary signals. And the beauty of that is that signal could just be human speech. Uh, and that's great because that is going to uh, get carried through our device under test. So now I'm going to go and select. I happen to um, have some proper IEEE real speech signals. And uh, let's... Uh, And now the settings here are a little bit complicated, but the question is, what is the thing that we're going to calculate our transfer function against? And exactly here, instead of calculating it against the generator, I'm going to calculate it against an input channel. And that input channel um, could be um, one of the inputs on PDM16, or uh, it could be my reference microphone. The match is a bit of, of if we were doing an asynchronous test, we're, we're not. So I can actually just set that to none. The time alignment is if I want to take out any time of flight and I will say, yep, I want to align that relative to the reference or I don't want to do any time alignment at all, or I'd like to time align it relative to one of my input channels. And I'll say, yeah, I want to look at the time alignment of the channels on the board itself. So I'll do the time alignment vis-a-vis -vis -vis PDM16. And I'm actually going to do it to uh, channel two because that's the one that's closest to the speaker. And uh, let's do this at 48,000 uh, uh, 48, uh, sample FFT transform. And we're going to do a bunch of averages with some overlap, because human speech has a lot of silence in it, actually. And I'll do it until I have averages equal to the length of my stimulus signal, which is 10 seconds. There we go. And then I'll say go. Oh, analog input range changed. Thank you. I'll fix my input range. Dan, can we hear that signal too? Um, I'm happy to send you the WAV file. I'm not currently technically set up to uh, route the audio from the APX into this um, Zoom meeting. OK. OK, so actually, the first thing that I look at when I look at the outputs of a transfer function is what's called the coherence. Uh, and the coherence is kind of what the word suggests. It's like how closely does the output of the device under test match the magnitude and phase of the input to it. 
Um, and, you know, so the range is zero to one, or you can have it in percent if you want, but most people look at coherence as zero to one. And what you can see is as the energy output of both the signal and the speaker falls off, our coherence falls off at high frequency, and it also has some problems at low frequency. But again, in this range, uh, and this is a speech signal of like 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz, our coherence is pretty great. So that's kind of the range in which we're going to look uh, for uh, comparison of results. And if we look at FRF magnitude, so here is the frequency response. Now, again, I kind of want to ignore some tails. So let's look at it in the range where we had good coherence. So here's the magnitude response within uh, that range of the measurement. And we can look at this in dBFS per Pascal. And so here's our frequency response. And again, you know, what's cool about this is we've gotten the frequency response without having to use a sine wave as a stimulus. Here is our phase. Now, one thing to notice is how the um, calculated phase gets wonky at high frequencies. And that's, again, the coherence has fallen off. And so the calculation of the phase goes um, sideways when there's poor signal to noise ratio. But sort of, again, in that, um, in that range where we have a good measurement. Just to get the noise off the screen, we get a very nice plot of the phase response. And you do also uh, some signal processing guys say, hey, can I get the, the impulse response so I can uh, feed that into a fil filter generation algorithm? If you're curious, here's the actual acquired signal from all 16 mics. Can you explain how the overlapping averages works and and uh, you know what the what the reason for that is? Sure. It's almost as if I've queued you up with questions, Jeff. Um, so here's I should, our actual. I should know the answer, but I'm I'm asking you know truthfully. Yeah. <laughs> so so here is the actual waveform uh and this is i uh, you know it would have been it would i should have set this up so, so we could actually hear it but but this is an actual human male uh speaking a bunch of harvard uh reference sentences and as compared to a sine wave you notice that you know if we looked at this as an amplitude envelope there is a lot of silence um in human speech where we pause when we say things where we modulate our amplitude. Um, and so, whereas if this was just like a, a one kilohertz sine wave, you don't, you, you know, you can sample a one kilohertz sine wave for a few milliseconds and have a measurement. But with human speech, because uh, it's so variant with time, you really need to integrate over a long period of time to get a repeatable measurement. So there are two things. We could just make the FFT long enough so that we capture the whole signal, but that would, you know, FFT calculations are exponentially um, increase uh, as you increase the uh, acquisition time. So that would be prohibitive from a computational standpoint. Uh, so instead what we'll do is we'll do a relatively short, I mean, actually still relatively long FFT at 48K, but not millions or tens of millions of points. 
And what we'll do is we'll average them. So what you have to imagine is uh, at 48K, it works out that each FFT is one second long. So we do an FFT from zero to one, and that encompasses that portion of the signal. And then we would do another FFT, and then we would average those FFTs together. The overlap comes in, uh, instead of going from zero to one, and then one to two, and then two to three, is I've set the overlap at 50%. So the second FFT is going to start at 500 milliseconds and go to 1.5 seconds. And the reason we want to do that is the FFT itself has an amplitude window, which tapers at the beginning and end of the acquisition. And that taper is excluding uh, energy. So we're just trying to essentially slide an averaging window through this entire acquisition so that all the energy in the acquisition gets included in our calculation. And uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be this long. So for example, um, you know, we could take a look at, let's do, let's capture just 2.5 seconds. But you notice it's gone kind of wonky up here. Um, and, and that's definitely in our, in our phases kind of wonky. Um, and we just haven't gotten enough, you know, this is a, a signal that's varying with time. And so we're just doing averaging so that we can get as much repeatability as possible. No, oh, that makes makes more sense. Then I was wondering uh, the earlier uh, coherence you showed; it was oscillating back and forth. Is that a function of the fact that you, I, I believe you only use a sweep time of two and a half seconds? If I saw that earlier menu where you set the generator, uh, is that could that? Uh, no. So it, so in this case, so if we go back to. So now I've set this so the total acquisition length for this measurement right. will be 10 right. seconds. Okay. And what's interesting here is here we're looking at coherence, and this is between between the reference microphone and the MEMS microphones. It's actually, mm -hmm. so what's interesting is we have actually some coherence at low frequency because what's actually going on is it's picking up the room noise and that's essentially becoming part of the test. If I set my reference to be generator, so the mics aren't in a box. I know they're remote and you can't see them, but they're in a, Correct. They're actually room. just they're just sitting in a table. Okay. So notice yeah. how how our coherence has completely fallen off at low frequencies, mm -hmm. and that's because now we're looking at the coherence between the speaker's output and the mics, and the speaker just has no output at low frequency. Right. Yeah. And you're using a a Hanning waiting window when you're you're discussing leakage and, and averaging earlier. So this is actually an equiripple window that I'm using right now. Okay. You can you can select your your FFT window that you'd like ripple. to use. Interesting. Is that your own yeah. invention? That's uh, <laughs> I haven't heard of that. Uh, um, it, it 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 I would like to claim that it is. It's not. Um, oh, okay. And um, we you know we've been playing around with FFT windows for a really long time, and it's our favorite. I mean, for me personally. Uh, this is getting super obscure, but pretty much there are two windows that I use. I either use EquiRipple or I use flat top or none, but I don't really, that's not really a window anymore. Right. Um, okay. okay, so 
Uh, I've gone a bit above my time. I like to, you know, just take a moment and entertain any questions anyone has. The uh, sensitivity measurement, is that specific to version six? Yes. Okay. Transfer function was added in version five. Yeah. Um, multi input and sensitivity was added in version six. What is the, I don't quite get the name sensitivity. That does not equate to what I, I think know. that would that that should be. <laughs> That's um, why I didn't understand when you were talking about sensitivity. So. I know. So the reason we called it that is the result it gives you is um, what most people think of as a sensitivity measurement. You know. So this is. Um, DBFS per Pascal. And um, I, I, I completely agree with you. All, I've, all I will offer you is that um, in my time doing product management, I've learned to stay out of fights involving colors or names. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Um, and so we call this sensitivity because the result it gives you is what most people think of as sensitivity. Now, of these two tests, you know, this acoustic response and the transfer function, which one would you trust on a on a daily basis, or is that really dependent on what you're what you're testing and what what signals you're testing with? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is if I'm testing, uh, it's pretty simple. If I'm testing a bare microphone, and there's no active signal processing involved, and so I know that I can use a sine wave as the stimulus signal then I would use uh, acoustic response or continuous sweep or some, you know, sort of a standard measurement. Um, transfer function is really handy. Well, in fact, it's pretty much your only choice as soon as you're testing something where there's active signal processing involved and you don't get to pick your stimulus signal anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, again, in the telecom world, for example, there are a bunch of tests uh, where they, where you're required to use IEEE real speech as the stimulus signal, and sort of that falls into that category um, where you don't get to pick your stimulus signal, and now you need to make a measurement using something other than a sinusoid.